This to me is the essence of what I think good teaching is. The learning intentions are very clear. The success criteria is absolutely obvious. The amount of peer work is dramatic. There is lots of discussion about the task amongst people. It's not all just in one head. There is peer involvement in the task, and then when you achieve the end, you want to excel and do it again and keep going. And this notion of outward bound, I think, sums up what I think you're going to see at the top of my chart. For example, the peer influences are up there. You're going to see on this number 34, challenge. It is an incredibly challenging task for those of you who have never done an abseil in your life. It is an almost dauntingly challenging task, but you succeed. And of all the years I've taught um, abseiling, we've never yet had a person who hasn't gone over, despite the incredible motion. And you don't do it by telling them. The peers encourage them, and the encouragement is very high. And they see success in those who do it. The worst thing you can do in a school, the worst thing you can say as a parent, is do your best. Because <laughs> that's easy. There's no challenge in doing your best, because whatever you do is your best. Number 30, worked examples, is a very good example of success criteria in action. Show them what success looks like. The majority of teachers in New Zealand start most lessons with WALT, W-A-L-T. What are we learning today? That alone is not enough. What are we learning today? And this is what it looks like when it's successful. The effects are quite dramatic. Don't make it a mystery. Look, mathematics is a good example. If students are struggling to understand the mathematics notions, for goodness sake, give them the answer, because then they'll concentrate on the process. We have to spend a lot more time helping students understand the strategies and the processes of getting the answer and not make them think that education and learning and schooling is about getting the right answer. Yes, we want that too, but we have to teach them the strategies, which are going to be very powerful. Socioeconomic status is in there, and it is powerful. But there are 32 things that are more powerful than socioeconomic status, so that should never be an excuse for why kids can't learn. We went out and we, we measured in minutes what teachers talked about in their tea room, in the lunchtime, and their professional development courses. In elementary school, it's the three Ks. is the curriculum, is the kids, and in New Zealand, it's the kicking footballs. In high school, we add tests. One minute a month, teachers talked to each other about teaching that which matters. But one minute a month, and I ask you when you go around your staff rooms, how often do teachers talk about teaching? And we have a whole profession that says, don't talk about teaching. And one of the ways we do it is we say, sir, I respect you because you teach different from me. And I absolutely give you every right to do that. And what I'm saying to you is, don't you touch me. When I go into my classroom and close my door, I'm going to teach any way I like, so leave me alone. And that's the thing we've got to change in our profession. We've got to bring the debate about teaching and learning much more to the fore. And the teaching strategies are up there. Look at not labelling students. Take two kids of the same ability. Call one learning disabled or dyslexic or whatever the latest jargon is and compare it to the kid that's not labelled and you get that dramatic effect. It's another excuse we use why we're not having an effect. University people say to me, well, I'm dyslexic. I say to them, well, what are you doing about it? I can fix that. And many of them are angry that I even can say that because they have successfully used that label to not learn for many, many years. Yes, it exists. Yes, it's real. But my goodness, those things are fixable. I had a colleague, Graham uh, Nuttall. He spent his lifetime putting microphones on kids in the class every morning of the school year. And in the afternoon, he'd go home and he'd analyse them. He found, for example, that um, about 40% of what every teacher teaches on every lesson, the kids know already. He found out that um, found about 70 to 80% of class time is spent in one activity, pretending to listen. <laughs> Teachers talk 70 to 80% of the time. As an aside, the work I've done on class size, they actually talk more in smaller classes, but that's another story. The notion of um, mass and space practice, what Graham found also was that all of us, slow learning or fast learning, usually need three to four exposures of material before we have a reasonable chance of learning it. And it's much better if it's done over time. 
Doing it sort of the drill way, many, many, many examples at the same time, is nowhere near as effective. Doing it over time and having multiple opportunities to come back, hopefully in different ways with different kinds of strategies, really makes a difference. Many of the things on my chart, at the top of my chart, are very successful with both the slower learners and the faster learners. If acceleration is so good for gifted kids, what would happen if we used it on the slow learning kids? It is just as effective. What those kids need is not more of the things they can't do, but a variety of other activities that spiral them up so that they start to get the higher level concepts faster. So let's go to the top ten. The one at the very top, self-reported grades, I ask a student what grade they're going to expect on a test. They are brilliant at predicting it, which in many senses worries the heck out of me. We know a lot about teacher expectation, but my worry with that one is the student expectation. For so often we say to a kid, how are you going to perform? And they, they choose a safe level that they're going to perform at, and they do. And when teachers say to me, my job is to help kids reach their potential or meet their needs, I say, no, it's not. Your job is to help them exceed their potential. Our job is to exceed that, and we can. And certainly the providing formative evaluation up there is providing formative evaluation to the teacher about how they're going. Let me spend a moment to try and build the story. And it's going to be partly about feedback, it's going to be partly about challenge. If I divide up the variance explained, it is the case that about half the variance explained the kid. But short of being a brain surgeon, I can't do much about that. We spend a lot of time in education worrying about that. We like to come up with different school structures so that we can choose the kids we want to teach. We come up with all this crazy nonsense about um, brains and multiple intelligences and learning styles, which have zero effect. And yet again, another way to label kids. The majority of the variants of what we can control is the teachers. Not as much from the home, as many argued. The power of peers, I think, can be dramatic, and we, but we've not used them. Go back to my outward bound example. The effects of schools, if they take two kids of the same ability, it doesn't matter what school they go to. It's the variability amongst teachers that's the most dramatic in our system. It's some teachers who do certain things that have powerful effects on kids. But half our teachers aren't doing those things and are not getting those above average effects. My mantra is the visible learning, and that's why we call ourselves the Visible Learning Lab, and that's why I've called the book Visible Learning. Is how can we make the learning visible to the teacher? How can I get inside your mind and hear what you are thinking about what I'm saying? Not me ask you a few questions and picking out the person who knows the right answer. Listening skills are so powerful. And what my whole mantra is, how do we come up with ways to help teachers hear how students are learning? Stop the talk might be a very good starting point. My big messages are, there are certain mindsets that we need to have if we're going to do the things at the top of my chart. And one of the most powerful ones is teachers who see themselves as evaluators. And I go back to the, that example before about principles. When you ask the question, is this working better than that? What is the evidence that you can have that you are having a 0 0.4 effect? But this notion of teachers as evaluator, I think it's extremely powerful. That's your fundamental job, is to evaluate your instruction and your effects. <coughs> We've got to get away from the notion that tests are about kids. Remember self-reported instruction. <coughs> when you give a test in a classroom, it's for you to find out how well you went, who you taught well, who you didn't teach well, what did you teach well to whom. And if you have that mindset, the effects are much greater. Similarly, this notion, it's about the teachers. Now, of course it's about the kids. But the mindset is teachers can make changes. Teachers have the power to be change agents and can make, have high standards, have challenging goals, have success criteria, have multiple strategies, give the kids different rather than more, and so on. And teachers who have this particular mindset make a difference. And Carol Dweck and others, and certainly the work we're doing, is showing that the mindset of how you do it is much more powerful than what strategies they use, what teaching competencies uh, in terms of content knowledge they have. It's their attitude. The feedback was so powerful through the top 20 or 30 things in my chart. Take challenge, for example. If the task is easy, one plus one, what does it equal? Me then giving you feedback about that task is pointless you're going to get it right. 
Feedback works powerfully when you don't know. When there's an incredible amount of challenge in the task. Let me tell you, the outward bound case, when you give people repelling off the side of a cliff, they actually seek the feedback, which I don't see in classrooms very often. And so this notion of what feedback is, is dominating to me, and what worries me is how infrequent it is. And I'm talking about information about the task. There's the challenge versus the be do, do the best as a contrast. Teachers who believe their job is to make tasks challenging for kids and to work out what is appropriately challenging are much more effective than teachers who argue that our job is to cover the curriculum and the children have to do their best. And I hope you can see a picture I'm trying to paint here of teachers you know who have these attitudes. And it is the case that if you have these attitudes, it requires more passion. And it does require more time and investment. It is so much easier to take last year's lessons out and modify it for this year's class because the kids are kind of exchangeable. It does require a different attitude. The relationships in the classroom. Now, they are important for a very simple reason. You've got to build trust before kids will admit they don't know. So if I said to you, ma'am, um, how am I going right now? Now, if I'm going to get what she's really thinking, <laughs> I'm going to have to build some trust with you. I'm going to have to build a relationship with you. Not only am I going to have to build it with you, I'm going to have to build it with you so that when she says something that is completely wrong or maybe completely accurate but critical, you're not allowed to jump on her. You're not allowed to say, oh, she doesn't understand or whatever. So building the trust about the whole class to allow you to express what you're really thinking is what the teacher-student relationship is all about. It's not I love you and I care about you, even though that helps to get that trust. It is when a student feels confident they can say they don't know. Classrooms where error is tolerated, where error is welcomed, are the classrooms where learning occurs. So this um, notion of teachers, leaders as evaluators is the theme that I was wanting to promote, you, to promote to you today about what attitudes and thinking I have as a teacher when I go into a classroom. It, it sounds negative, but the message is, how can I do it better? What aren't I doing very well? And how do I collect evidence that relates to that. And that, to me, is what evidence-based teaching and learning is about. It's none of this throwing another set of tests and accountabilities at schools. It's none of this about collecting more data, because schools are awash with data. The last thing they want is more data. It's about teachers asking and collecting evidence about themselves. Remember what Graham Nuttall's work with the microphones? His argument is 70% of what happens in the classroom a teacher does not see. So all that reflective teaching stuff is just rubbish. Because teachers are reflecting on stuff about 30% of what happened. The only way reflective teaching works is if you actually have evidence of what happens in the classroom. And you reflect on that, preferably with other teachers. Why is micro-teaching so powerful out there? Something we hardly ever do outside teachers' colleges, and even teachers' colleges hardly do it anymore. So this notion of how we can constantly ask about whether there is merit and worth, and how I can provide evidence that I'm having those effects that are greater than the average ones is what my message is about. And what I'm doing in the last couple of slides is doing what I said to you before. I'm doing the same thing now two or three times to hope you get the message. This is what I want teachers to be, the active calculating teachers, the multiple opportunities. So that's what I want teachers to do. Have learning intentions, have success criteria, worry about progress. And that's what I want students to do. And so that's my message to you today about how we can go about trying to make learning visible to the teacher. The incredible powers of teachers, if they have those mindsets. And how we spend so much time in our education business talking about the things that don't matter and not confronting that which really matters. But let me remind you at the end, I'm not criticizing teachers here. Half our teachers are doing these things. And we need a profession where we acknowledge that we esteem that, and we privilege those teachers to help all of them in the school to make the difference. Evidence does count. Thank you.